Good afternoon. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you, Professor? Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, yeah we hear you. Good. Let's hope this will last. Okay, last time, I'll quickly review what we did there. We looked at a string of length L. And we consider the displacement U as a function of X and I. And we derived the equation, partial differential equation that u t t equals to a squared u x x, where a squared was a notation for tension divided by mass per unit length. Just a second, let me turn off the AC because it's too noisy. All right. Okay, and we, we looked for a solution of it. And of course, conditions, boundary conditions were that U of zero and t is equal to u of l and t and equal to zero. And we look for solution by method of separation of variables. And that was that u of x and t was assumed to be a product of the function of just x, which is called the modal shape. And the theta of t, which is just the modal amplitude, or multiply, right? It takes the shape of multiplets, a different moment of time at different values, right there, right, okay? And we found the modal shapes to be xn was sine of pi n over lx. That's what we found using substitution and boundary conditions. The n being one, two, three, and so on. And the shapes are like this. The x1 would be like this with only crossing at the end, that's the x1. The x2 would be having one more point of crossing, that's the x2. The x3 will have three points of, uh, I mean, two points of crossing, that's x3 and so on, etc. So the x sub n will have n minus one crossing points inside the, the beam, all right? And we had the find the theta n, and the result is that u was equal to summation of all that is called modal superposition. So we superimpose all these solutions for each n, modal superposition. And that's from n equal to one to infinity, we include all the infinitely many nodes. When we do the practical calculation, of course, we include only the first five, six modes, that's enough. But in this case, it's gonna be the theta, which is a sub n, cosine of pi n a over l t plus b sub n sine of pi n a over l t multiplied by the x of x which is sine of pi n over l x all right using this we can find for example the velocity as well or the speed right there, this can be u sub t 
which is du over dt. Now there's going to be summation with n starting at 1 to infinity. When we take derivative of this piece, that doesn't de depend on t, we'll have derivative of each term times this multiplier here. So we can put that multiplier outside. And inside you will have minus a sub n sine of pi n a over lt plus b sub n cos of pi n a over lt. All of that multiplied by the same mode shape, sine of pi n over a x, over l, sorry, x. Now, how do you find these coefficients? You find them using the notion that we discussed last time, orthogonality, and we need to have initial conditions. Initial conditions, I didn't mention it last time, but we brought it now. There were two of them because we have second derivative with respect to time. One of them will be u of x and zero, that's initial displacement, equals to, in general speaking, g1 of x. Let's say whatever the shape is, say it's like this, right, okay. And the, dis the velocity, u sub t of x and zero, equals to, a second. equals to another function, they are independent of each other. Initial velocity, initial displacement independent. So let's make it, uh, for example, like this, right? Okay, that's the G2 of X. So using these, we can find the constants A n and B n in the following way. We take this expression, which we'll call one, and the other one will be the U sub T, that will be two. I would say u1, uh, sorry. We take u of x and zero. We will plug in the time equal to zero here. And the time equal to zero in cosine will be give you, will make it one, and sine will make it zero. So it's gonna be summation of just a sub n sine of pi n over lx from one to infinity. And that is supposed to be equal to g1 of x. And we'll do it using the notion of inner product, which we discussed last time. So we take the inner product of both sides. I'll call the inner product like this, of both sides. With a certain mode shape, which with, uh, let's say, sine of pi k over Lx. We notice that the sine of pi n over Lx and sine of pi k over Lx will be, as we discussed last time, will be zero if k is not equal to n. Now, if it's equal to n, we can take the inner product will be the integral. Um, let's see, the inner product is defined, I didn't write it down. We'll define the inner product to be integral from of f and g integral from uh, zero to L of f of x, g of x, dx. So this integral will be, this inner product will be zero to L of sine squared of pi n over Lx. And that dx, and that will give you, after you replace by trigonometric formula, it will give you L over two so it's going to be a level of two for k, for k equal to n. So the result of this, when you apply the inner project, we'll have that 
a summation with n equal to one to infinity of a sub n times inner product of the pi n over Lx. That's when n running through all the values with sine of particular pi k over Lx equals to inner product of g1 of x with sine of pi k over Lx. Which is, now you realize these are all zero unless n equals to k. So therefore the result, all the terms disappear except for a sub k. And in that case, sine square will be L over two equals to interval from zero to L of G one of X sine of pi k or L X DX. From here, we'll find the A sub k equals to two over L interval from zero to L of G one of X sine of pi k over L x dx. Any questions on this so far? I assume not, right, okay. Now we found the a sub k, now we need to find the b sub k. So we take the u sub t put a u sub t of x and zero. That will be summation with n starting from one to infinity. Remember we had that expression, uh, u sub t, it had the pi and a in front and so on, right? So write down pi, and a over L. <coughs> so we have minus a n, <coughs> which we already all know, sine of pi n a over L t. Uh, and that would be zero because t is zero, plus b sub n cos of pi n a over L t. And that would be one times sine of pi n over a x. And that is supposed to be equal, well, let's do the, maybe make it a little bit more compact. Uh, it's gonna be pi n a over L, b sub n sine of pi n over a x. And that is supposed to be equal to g2 of x at this given. From here, use similar logic, use logic as above. And we get that now the coefficient will be this whole thing, not just B sub n. So pi n a over L B sub n equals two. <clears throat> uh, two over L interval from zero to L of <coughs> um, G2 of X sine of pi N A over L, uh, sorry, of pi N over L, <coughs> of pi N over L X DX. Canceling out the L's, we have B sub N equals to two over pi and a interval from zero to L of G2 of X sine of pi n over L X dx. So that's how we found all the coefficients and the problem is now solved, right? Any question about this part? Okay, in that case, we go back to our finite element and apply dynamics there, right? If you guys done with this page, I'm going to the next page. You guys finished writing? Anybody yeah. alive, sir? Yeah, I'm done. 
Okay. Our vibration in finite elements. Remember the finite element this equation would be k times q equals to p. These are nodal forces which are obtained by combining everything, right? But they're all static forces within Euclidean dynamics. And this is nodal displacements. What we need to do is we need to add to dynamics, you need to add viscous damping forces I will call them the C times Q dot. All right. Um, of course, what we also need to add that in this case, the Q becomes a function of T, the nodal displacements. And the nodal forces become also function of T. That's besides the point, viscous damping forces. And we need to add the important part of the inertia forces. These, by the way, will be one the minus, and these will be minus mass matrix times Q double dot. And we'll try to find what these things are. To find the mass matrix, we'll consider the virtual work again. For the element. So remember that the uh, field displacement in the element, field displacement inside the element, displacements, I call them by letter C. And that was equal to the N matrix times Q. And that's the shapes. Of course, when we take the derivatives, it's going to be, these are also function of time. So the velocities will be C dot. That's going to be the N times Q dot. Accelerations. It will be C double dot throughout the element, which is equal to N times Q double dot. Uh, the inertia force, well, damping force will be discussed much later, next time, but inertia force will be integral over the volume of the element. And then we have minus rho times the accelerations and times element of volume. So that will be the inertia force for the element. Now we plug in what C stands for, it's going to be equal to minus the V of the element, rho, and C stands this one, it's going to be the N times Q double dot.
right? Uh, that would be if you don't, all right, so, all right, let's just, you know, if you force, uh, let me correct it a little bit, because that's going to be per element, that's I wanted to per volume, df, and we won't take the integral yet, all right, so it's going to be, we'll do the integral a little bit later, we have to do some virtual work, right, okay. Okay. Now, the virtual work, virtual work will be uh, for these forces. They are applied at every point. There will be delta C transpose times the forces, which are at each location, they are minus a row and Q double dot D, right, okay. Which will be minus, okay, delta C transpose, C is N Q, so it's gonna be N times Q as a function of time, but the right, okay. Transpose rho N Q double dot DV. That's ele elementary virtual work per volume DV, right, okay. Now, when you do the, uh, that's going to be delta, right? So we get delta Q, okay? Which is going to be minus delta Q trans, transpose times N transpose times rho times N times Q double dot times D. All right. Uh, the the whole total virtual work will be the volume interval. It's going to be virtual work equals to minus volume integral of delta Q transpose and transpose rho n d volume and outside we can have a Q double dot because that doesn't change inside the element. They're the, the fixed nodal, nodal accelerations. And we can factor out the delta Q transpose outside. It's going to be minus delta Q transpose integral over the volume of the element of n transpose rho n dv multiplied by q double dot. Now that's the nodal force. That's a nodal displacement. Therefore, this is the nodal force, right? Okay. So the equivalent uh, nodal force to inertia forces will be minus integral over the volume of the element and transpose rho n dv and times q double dot. And that's exactly equal to the term that we look with the with the road. This is going to be equal to minus m of matrix of the element times q. Or for this, for the whole system, it's the same thing, right? Okay. So therefore, we have the mass matrix m, mass matrix for the element.
equals to integral over the volume of the element. Uh, just a second. And transpose shape matrix rho n dv. That's for the element. And then, since it's also nodal, uh, the for the system you combine the appropriate degrees of freedom. Why is that? Why can we combine it? Let's look at the physical meaning of it. Uh, physical meaning. of mass matrix component. I'll have to go to the next page. You guys done here? Yes, no? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, let's look at the general equation. Uh, remember the forces there, well, we didn't try to down, so let's just go there. We have that the um, nodal force is given, right, equals to kx, k times the displacements. But we have to augment now uh, minus m times Q double dot plus P equals to K Q. All right. So that means we bring it to the other side. We have M Q double dot plus K Q equals to P, right? Okay. We can put the matrix sign later, etc. Okay. Now we can add the damping, and that will discuss the details next time. We have the M Q double dot plus C Q dot plus KQ equals to the forces which are given as nodal forces as functions of time, right? Okay, so we need to concentrate on this. To get the physical meaning of it, we need to find what physical quantity will this become. So we're shooting for the force because that's the only one there. So. To get the force to be a physical meaning of this, we need to have these zero out. So first thing we have Q to be zero and Q dot to be zero. If that's the case, then we have the equation that M, sorry, M Q double dot equals to P. Let's consider what is the physical meaning, for example, oops, what am I writing there? Physical meaning of, for example, um, M12. So how can we tie it to the measured physical quantities? We'll write down the first line here. We'll have the M11, Q1 double dot, 
plus M12, aha, that's our animal, Q2 double dot, plus M13, Q3 double dot, all the way to the nth, whatever number degree of freedom is, QN double dot, equals to P1. We're only just interested in the first row, right? We're interested in this. So to get this one, we need to have all of these to be zero, and Q2 double dot to be one. These ones have to be all zero. Then the M12 will be exactly equal to P1. So we can write down in general. that the M12 is the inertia force, not inertia, just force. Don't need to worry about it. Is the force here, P1, in degree of freedom, one, when Remember that we had all the, uh, the displacements and velocity of the zero when all degrees of freedom uh, displacements and velocities are zero. All accelerations except for degree of freedom to all accelerations, except for degree of freedom to are zero, and acceleration in degree of freedom to is That's the physical meaning of M12. Now let's Take an example and find the components of a mass matrix of some simple element. Are you guys done with this? Can we uh, proceed? Yeah. Thank you. Example. Find the mass matrix or two node road rod in its own axis. Here is a rod. Oops, it is there, but I'd rather draw it like this. The length is L. This is the x axis. It starts here. All right, this is node one. This is node two. Okay, so the displacements are just the U1 and U2. The shape matrices are N1 equals to 1 minus X over L. So N1 of 0 equals to 1. N1 of L equals to 0. N2 equals to X over L. N2 of 0 equals to 0. N2 of L equals to 1. Uh, the element of volume here equals to the area of the rod times dx. All right, the density is rho, and we'll have then that the mass matrix 
equals to, by definition, it's the integral over the volume of the element, the mass matrix, trans uh, sorry, the shape matrix transpose, rho shape matrix times the element of volume, which is ADX. This is going to be integral. Well, we take the integral from 0 to L. That's the dx change away. And this will be the n matrix here is n1, which is 1 minus x over L times x and then x over L. That's the transpose row. We we'll put an A over here as well. Well, and we have the N, which is one minus X over L, X over L, DX. These will be integral of A row This will be a one minus x over L squared, x over L, one minus x over L, x over L, one minus x over L, and x over L squared, all of the dx. Now recall that uh, the mass of the whole rod is rho a l, right? So keep that in mind. I did this calculation, I did the integration here, and the result turns out to be, let's assume now that a rho is constant. Using this, the matrix will be M naught over three, M naught over six, M naught over six, and M naught over three. I did the integration and uh, it's not hard to integrate each of these. So pay attention. What's the sum of all these terms? It's going to be m naught over three and over three. That's going to be the sum. Will be the total. Will be summation of m i i. Will be just mass of the whole thing. So this is just breakdown of the mass into how much mass goes into each degree of freedom. Okay. So that's going to be, this is going to be, so M11 equals to M0 over 3. M12 equals to M21 equals to M0 over 6. And M22 equals to M0 over 3. Now this way of finding it is called, this is called, this was consistent mass matrix. So it distributed the mass per degrees of freedom in accordance with the shape functions, right? Okay. How much uh, a rough estimate, a rough approach would be to use a lumped mass approach. So in this case, it would be like this. You look at the rod that has constant cross section, and constant mass density. So you think that the each half of it will take equal masses and would put it on the diagonal of the mass matrix. So in this case, mass lumped will be 
m naught over two, m naught over two, zero, zero. Remember the first one is more, more exact. The second one is faster and easier, right? Okay. Okay, now, so I'm gonna to go to the next page again. Are you guys done with this page? Yes. So the general equation for the system that's called discretized system, because we have a finite element model, we'll have the following one, we'll have that the equation will be whatever we wrote there before. M Q double dot plus C Q dot plus K Q equals to the nodal forces that we found otherwise it's how to solve it, even on the software, various approaches. But first we have to go with the simplest case and see how, what we can do. Simplest case. Normal modes. And that will be when the free undamped vibration. The modes of undamped vibration will be free and they will be normal means orthogonal. It means we neglect the C, we ne neglect the P and the P, that means free means P is zero. And then means the matrix C is zero. Uh, C is just zero, right? Okay. The equation becomes M Q double dot plus K. Equals to P. Oh, sorry, equals to zero. Free and then right? equals to zero. Okay. Or I done zero. Solution will use separation of variables. We know that in time we need to have oscillations as cosine and sine. So to combine them together, we'll write it down that the, we'll assume that Q, the nodal displacement vector is equal to E to the I omega T, that's the timepiece with frequency unknown, multiplied by the nodal vector, nodal shape vector, which I will call now uh, let's see, what letter should I use? Let's use a Greek letter nu or eta. That is called the modal shape vector. And this is the omega is the frequency in radian per second. And of course, you guys remember that uh, e to the i omega t is cos of omega t plus i sine of omega t. So writing this thing like this, it splits the problem into two problems, one for cos and the other for sine, but we don't have to bother with it. The results will be automatic. We just use this. That's very convenient. 
So from here we go, we need to have second derivative will be, when you take first derivative, you'll have i omega, second one, i omega squared, which is gonna be minus omega squared, e to the i omega t times eight. Plug it into the equation, we have minus omega squared m e to the i omega t times eta. plus k e to the i omega t times eta equals to zero. e to the i omega t is not zero, very easy. The result, we have a problem which we call minus omega squared m plus k is a matrices times eta, which is called vector equals to zero. This looks kind of like the eigenvalue problem, but a little bit different because we have two matrices here and no identity matrix. Like that's called the generalized eigenvalue problem. Uh, there are procedures, software procedures, that will solve this problem. I will show some example how to do it in uh, Scilab. Unfortunately, MATLAB license on my CalPoly computer, once I try to connect to the lab, it says the license expired. Probably I don't have the updated version there, so uh, I have to go there. In order to go to there to have them install updated version, I need to write a petition to the, basically to the president of university. Why do I need to go my, to my office? Uh, I need to, so that, to see the technician, the when, and until it gets approved, it takes three, four days. So I found it out this morning that the MATLAB is not there. I have another version of MATLAB on my other laptop, maybe I'll, on my own laptop, but let's see. It's, but there, I don't have the camera there, right? So we'll see what happens. So, but I will show you how to do it in Scilab. It's about the same, right? Okay. It's, uh, MATLAB is easier than the Scilab, right? So, but there we'll discuss some properties. The interesting properties will be, this is equation, let's call it, I didn't number any equation, let's call it a star. And we'll rewrite this equation in a different form. And that will be like this. Uh, that will be the minus omega squared, uh, sorry, I take it in the other side. So we'll have that k eta equals to m, uh, equals to omega squared m eta. I'm gonna drop the column vector and column uh, uh, and matrix notation because it's gonna be easier this way. Let's call this one double star, right? okay. Now the following properties are important in what we're trying to derive. First of all, the K transpose equals to M transpose. Uh, sorry, K transpose equals to K and M transpose equals to M, okay? These are symmetrical matrices by definition that we had, it's, uh, they're gonna be symmetric, right? Symmetric matrices, right? Okay. Properties are like this. Consider omega, say, m, not m, omega l squared and eta l, and omega n squared and theta n. If the frequencies are different, if omega L squared is not equal to omega N squared, then, then what? Then the modal shapes, we need these results for next time. 
shapes are orthogonal with respect to vector, with respect to matrix M and matrix K. What does it mean? Here's what it means. It means that if you take um, dot product of two vectors and put a K in between or M in between, it will be right. Remember that dot product of two vectors can be written down as one transpose times B, right? Okay. So in this case, it will be the eta L transpose M eta M eta, sorry, N equals to zero if L is not equal to N. And similarly with K. It's very important also to note that these are in this case uh, a number, right? Whether it's zero or not zero, it's gonna be a number, right? Okay, so the proof will be done in a minute. Proof is like this. You take for L and N, you take it K eta L equals to omega L squared uh, M eta L and K eta N equals to omega N squared M eta N. This is one and this is two. We pre-multiply by the other ones. We multiply the one by eta n, this one, transpose, and the two by eta l, transpose. So we'll have as a result eta n k eta l equals to omega L squared M, uh, sorry, eta N transpose M eta L. And similarly, the other one, that's transpose, right? Okay, we have eta L transpose K eta N equals to omega n squared eta l transpose m eta n. Now, uh, this is gonna be the one prime and this is two prime. And I will show that the left sides are the same. The left sides are equal. To do that, you note that the uh, each of them is a number. Why is that? This is a, a vector and this is a, row, a column vector. This is a row vector. Row vector times column vector, of course it's a number, right? Okay, is a number. And when the number is transpose, it stays the same. And lambda transpose equals to lambda for any number. So we'll take transpose of left side of the first equation. Eta N T K eta L transpose will be equal to. When you transpose, you flip the order. It's gonna be eta L transpose K transpose eta N. Transpose transpose means eta N. But K transpose equals to K because it's symmetric. So that's gonna be eta L transpose K eta N. 
but that's the same as left side of two prime. So that proves it. The left sides are equal. So then we take the one prime and subtract the two prime. The result will be zero because the left sides are equal. Zero equals two. And here is going to be again, these two are equal between themselves. So we can factor them out and inside will be the difference of squares of frequencies. It's going to be omega L squared minus omega N squared times the NML. All right, so if this is the equal to zero, then if omega L squared minus omega N squared is not zero as we claim, then omega n transpose omega um, m omega l is zero. So we have shown that the shapes are orthogonal with respect to mass matrix. Uh, with respect to K matrix, it's similar. You just do divide each one by frequency, assuming the frequency is not zero. So we write down that a one over omega L squared times eight um, N K eight L. Minus one over omega N squared eight N transpose K eight L equals to zero, very similar. And the result will be that that's for n not equal to l. Now we'll run an example in the Scilab, but before that we have to formulate the problem. We want to find the frequency of a lump mass model, right? Frequencies and modal shapes. If you guys are done with this page, I'll go to the next. You guys done here? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Example, uh, we have a, what is called a shear model of a building of a frame. So we consider a three story frame. So this is a lump mass model. So don't worry about finding. Okay, uh, degrees of freedom are, let's call this one to be degree of freedom one, we'll call it the Q1, Q2, actually no, I'd rather go Q1 at the bottom, and that will be Q3, all right. And the masses are, this will take a mass, M, this is 2M, and this is 3M, and the stiffnesses will be 3K, 2K, and K, right? Okay. And we go with, uh, first we'll find the ODEs for the system, similar to what you did in, this, in the systems class. And that will be like this. You'll take the M of this one first, and it has the force. If it displaces this way, the force is here. And that's going to be K times Q3 minus Q2. All right. And the ODE here will be minus K Q3 minus Q2 equals to mass Q3 double dot. Bring it to one side, we'll have the mass Q3 double dot uh, plus KQ3. 
uh, minus KQ2 equals to zero. And that's equation, let's call it, what is it, four. The next one is five, so that's gonna be for the next degree of freedom, we'll take this one. And for that one, the free body diagram will be, we'll just take this force and reverse it without changing the value. So it's gonna be force like this, KQ3 minus Q2. And on this side, you will have uh, 2K times the um, Q1 minus Q2. Uh, was it, no, Q2 minus Q1. All right, so this force will be pulling this way only if Q2 is bigger than Q1, right? Okay. And this is mass 2M. So we'll write it down that the um, K Q3 minus Q2 minus 2K Q2 minus Q1 equals to 2M Q2 double dot. Bring it on all to one side, we'll have 2m Q2 double dot. Uh, we'll have this one uh, minus 2k Q1 plus uh, 3k Q2. That's two from here, two from there. Pay attention that the if there is a Q2 plus and Q2 here have as the same plus sign, right? The other one may be different, right? Okay. And we have minus KQ3 equals to zero. That's equation five. And now we'll go to equation six, which is the bottom degree of freedom. So we draw this one, that's 3M. And here we just reverse this force. So there's gonna be this way, 2K, Q2 minus Q1. And this one will be force to the left of 3K, Q1. And the differential equation will be um, 2K, Q2 minus Q1. minus 3k q1 equals to 3m q1 double dot. Bring it into one side, pay attention to the signs, 3m q1 double dot. We have a minus 2k q2 and uh, plus 5q, 5k Q1 equals to zero. Pay attention that this is the same sign as this. It has to be the other ones could be plus or minus. This one has to be. So now we're formulating matrix form to find the matrices. You can see that the mass matrix will be diagonal here because it's a lump mass, a lump matrix. So you will have, I will start out with the last equation first because that's for degree of freedom one. So we'll have here 3M, uh, this one we had 2M. On uh, the first one we had just M. Sorry, third, third one, the Q3. M and this is M. The rest of them are zero because we we use consistent matrix. We just went with the lumped version. Just a second. And that's times, of course, the accelerations, and that would be Q1 double dot, Q2 double dot, Q3 double dot plus the K matrix, and that will be Q1, Q2, Q3.
And equations will be starting again from this one. You will have here a, for Q1, you'll have a 5K. For Q2, you will have minus 2K. Then we go to the next equation. You have minus 2K plus 3K minus K. Minus k. Oops, again. Keep writing q for k. I don't know why. What happens? And the first one, which is now the last one for degree of freedom three, it will be minus k and k. Pay attention that. You have to have the diagonal has to be positive, right? The other ones could be positive and negative in order to be positive, similar here. Uh, it has to be symmetrical also. You can check that it's symmetrical. And this one also. See, minus 2k, minus 2k, minus k, minus k. So, of course, it's easier to write this down in terms of factoring out the mass, the m and the k, and we'll do that. So we'll write down that the M three two one Q one Q double dot as a column. I'm not going to specify plus the K that is going to be five minus two zero minus two three minus one zero minus one uh, one right okay times Q equals to zero. Okay, so let me copy the matrices onto your paper. So I'll be able to enter them in, in Scilab and do the, perform the work. So the mass equals to three, two, one on diagonal. And the K is five minus two, zero, Minus two, three, and minus one. Minus one, one. Pay attention what we expect, what we want to have. The eta's will be vectors. So eta's will be eta one. So let's say eta one will be one, one, eta, one, two, eta, one, three. It will be a column vector consisting of three. The uh, omega squared will be the eigenvalues. That's what we expect. Now let's, um, since I copied this, you guys finish with this because I'm gonna unshare it and they'll share Scilab with you, Scilab. Uh, just, just a few more seconds. Sure, sure, sure. Remember that, that you can do it in MATLAB. There it's, the syntax is, is simpler. Uh, you also look at the help, the, the command in MATLAB is EIG, but you need to find which format of the command is there. It's not a regular EIG, okay, in MATLAB. In Scilab, the command is spec. Okay, I'm finished now, thank you. Yeah. All right, let me open up the Scilab. It open, but I don't see it. All right. Okay, here it is. So we'll share the screen with Scilab. Okay, now I'm going to open the help facility, so you might not see it, or maybe I'll share it with you because I first start with help. And let me share it then with you. You guys don't see the help, right? Do you? Somebody's got to have a microphone there, no? All right, never mind. 
Okay. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I know the command is spec, but I need to find a format. So don't get just a regular eigenvalue, but a, a eigenvalue for these two matrices, right? Well, okay. So we have the following formats, evals, Let's look at this one. That David doesn't give that gives only one result. And that's not what we need. All right. This is not what we need because there's only one matrix. So for two matrices, we have only one, two, three. And I suspect we only need this. So let's say alpha, beta, and z. Let's look at that. Now let's look at alpha beta first. Okay, so here is a tricky thing. If you look, it returns the spectrum of the matrix pencil A minus SB. Remember the S is the omega squared, right? Okay. It had the roots of the roots of matrix A minus SB. General's eigenvalues alpha and beta are so that the matrix A minus alpha dot slash beta is a single matrix. So the omega squared will have to, once we get the alpha and beta, we'll have to get alpha dot dash slash beta to get to the eigenvalues. Uh, the, uh, but that doesn't give you the R, R right there, right? So for R, we'll have to have three. So we have alpha, beta, R. Oh, good. All right. Now, the A minus S, B, that means the S is the omega squared. So that means B is a mass matrix. So the format should be uh, alpha, beta, R equals to spec of K matrix and M matrix because uh, M, B is multiplied by omega squared by eigenvalues. All right, good. Now that we find this, I'm closing this. I'm going to share your screen with, what's his name, with uh, Scilab. Okay. And he will enter first. I'll just enter it numerically. And I will write down the answer later on. M equals to. It'll be three, two, one, right? Okay, it's going to be three, zero, zero, semicolon, zero, two, zero, semicolon, zero, zero, one. Uh, something I didn't do. Okay, right, okay, you got it. I didn't space it out, okay. All right, that's the mass. K equals to, and that's going to be 5 uh, minus 2, 0, semicolon, minus 2, 3, and minus 1, semicolon, and 0, minus 1, 1. All right. Uh, when you type, sometimes you make mistake, always double check if the K prime equals to K and uh, M prime equals to M, right? So to make sure it's symmetric. So to do that, you subtract M prime minus M. So for example, M prime minus M will be zero. So means I entered it symmetrically, K prime minus K. So just because sometimes you make a typing mistake. I do that a lot of times. All right, so that's fine now. Now you write down the, remember the format ABZ, A, B, and R. R will give us the matrix consisting of eigenvectors. Equals to spec of um, K and M. Okay, this is the R and stuff, stuff like this. So now we need to find the eigenvalues. So I will do it like this. 
but not the eigenvalues, the frequencies. Frequencies omega are equal to, first is gonna be a dot slash b, that squares, that's the eigenvalues, we take the square root of it, right? Because our, our eigenvalues are squares. That's going to be square root of uh, a dot slash b. In MATLAB, you won't need to do all this stuff. You it will, it will get it right away. Okay. Now I'm going to copy this stuff into, um, into my one note. Good. And there I will write the answers and sketch the shapes. Are you guys done this way on, on this page, on this uh, whatever it is task? Somebody, do you have a microphone? Somebody say something. Uh, yes, Poison. All right, okay. Because I thought you guys all died. Sorry, don't die here. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna copy it to the one note. I'm gonna to go to the next page. And we're gonna control. Okay, it's here. And now uh, let me unshare the Scilab and the share the one note. Okay. So the A and B we don't really need, but we need the frequencies, all right? And uh, unfortunately, the Scilab doesn't do it in the right uh, sequence for us, but we'll do that, right? So um, the R, you look at there is a first column, there is a second column, and then the third column, all right? All right. Uh, this one, Okay, we'll try to plot them roughly, right? Okay. But just by looking at it, I can say that this should be our A to three. This will be our A to two. And this will be our A to one. And the reason for it is that A to one has all the same sign that means the wave shape is on the same side. It doesn't have any crossings. So we write down the eta one equals to, I'll copy it approximately, minus 0.34, minus 0 0.70, minus one. And it will look like this. So remember, uh, it's gonna be like this. That's the, uh, that's the three, four. Then we have 0.7, and then we have a one. All of them on the negative side, you have no crossing. That's the first eigenmode. Therefore, the first frequency should be the third frequency here in this piece, which is one, uh, which is gonna be 0 0.546, all right? But it's times square root of K over M. Remember, we didn't put the letters in there, right? So omega one, equals to, what was it? The 0 0.547, 0 0.547 roots of K over M. K over M are the constants there, right? Okay. The N2 will be there, right? Will be uh, minus 0 0.56, let's round it up, uh, minus 0 0.30, and one. So shape-wise, it will look like this. It will have a negative, uh, a negative, and a negative, and a positive. So we have one crossing point, that means it's the next mode. So the omega two will be 1.14. That's a larger frequency because it's a smaller mode shape, right, okay? Roots of K over M. 
And now we go with the last one, which is the first one here. And that's gonna be 0 0.7 minus one and 0 0.6. I just take it roughly to just to plot. 0 0.7 minus one and 0 0.6. Just by looking at it, we can see that there's two crossing points. It's gonna be 0 0.7 minus one and 0 0.6. So that's going to be that. And the omega-3 will be uh, 1.60, the largest frequency, times square root of k over m. OK. Any questions about this example and the topic? We'll finish up the damping, uh, and that will be kind of theoretical on Monday. Oh, sorry, yeah, on Monday. Right? Okay. Uh, so, Professor, this is a model matrix, right? Uh, for the N1, N2, and N3. Say it again. Uh, this is a model model matrix, right? The system uh, that's the system going to respond. Mm -hmm. Well, it's yeah, it consists of modes, right? It's model shapes vectors, right? Okay. The R is model shapes vectors. Oh, okay. Okay. So we plotted them roughly how they look like. Okay. All right, got it. Thank you. But for, uh, in terms of software, it, it's called generalized eigenvectors, right? So these are called for software, it's called these are the generalized eigenvectors. Generalized is because when you have regular eigenvectors, Regular eigenvectors is A minus lambda times identity matrix times the eigenvector V equals to zero. That's regular. In this case, we have K minus omega squared M. So you have two matrices here, right? Okay. Times the A equals to zero. This is regular and that's generalized. Okay, does it make sense? Uh, yes, bye, sir. Okay. But remember one, one thing that's uh, sometimes the word generalized eigenvector is applied to quite a different mathematical animal. So this is only for structural dynamics for vibration, right? Okay, so sometimes you might run into this and you will have a quite a different thing. So that's uh, make sure that you know what you're talking about with them. Okay. Any other, any other questions? Okay, in which case I'll let you go today early. Have a nice day. Yeah, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you, Professor. You finished, you, you finished writing this? Okay.